Good morning. Happy Wednesday to you. I pray you're having a great day today. It is beautiful outside. It's a beautiful morning here in Vail, and I'm so glad that you are joining me on our life-changing connection study. We are at the halfway mark today, and uh, that's very, very exciting. Um, Let's see, as far as birthday goes, we don't really have any birthdays. And uh, as far as the coronavirus goes, I think I'll probably, um, we did get a new, uh, uh, Pima County does statistics and they hadn't done any statistics since February 17th, but they released some a couple days ago and things are still going down and we're seeing a lot of people start to go out and mingle more and that's very exciting. I think we're very, very close to this thing. I don't know when we're completely out of it, um, but, and I don't know what that's going to mean when we get completely out of it, but we'll just have to pray for God's lead and that he continues to guide us and direct us and tell us what he wants us to do in the midst of all this stuff. Um, let's see. And uh, I think I think that's probably about it. We've got a, a, a longer Bible study this morning, so I think we'll just go ahead and get into it. We are in episode 20 of our study, Life-Changing Connection, and this is a topical Bible study to look at various topics of the Bible to help us kind of rest and think about what God's called us to do for our community and looking forward towards launching in November. So just... um, uh, just as a, uh, j- just as a um, kind of a, a precursor of what's to come, we're gonna we're gonna continue this Bible study up until Easter, and then after Easter, we're going to assemble uh, people, leaders, other people in the in the congregation, probably have some meetings and start to assemble some of the teams and look at some of the old teams and look at some new teams that may be required and that sort of thing. And that's that's going to happen after Easter. So be watchful for that because that's going to happen starting in April. We've got April, May, June, July, August, September, October, and then, and then we're, that's seven months, and then we launch this thing. So uh, let's see. Um, so yeah, we, we are in episode 20. And, and I want to talk a little bit about, about a different topic. We're going to talk about leadership, but I want to, I want to go this morning to, to a different Bible verse. I want to go to John 15. This is where Jesus is talking to his disciples. And I just want to read this for you. So join along with me or listen to John 15, beginning of verse 9. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says... As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love one another. I bring this up because this is towards the end of Jesus' life. Uh, Pretty soon he does his high priestly prayer and then he goes into Jerusalem and dies. this This is towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And he tells his disciples that it all comes down to love. And Jesus' love is a sacrificial love. Jesus said, no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend, and I call you my friends. Um, Jesus laid down his life for us. And that shows how much Jesus loved us. And what he calls us to do 
is to love the world as he has loved us. And how did he love us? By sacrificing. Now, whenever we think of sacrifice, we can mistakenly think that sacrifice means that we're going to die for Jesus, that we're going to give up our life for Jesus. In one way, that is true. We do, as followers of Jesus, give up. It doesn't necessarily mean an earthly death. The early church, there were some that did, most of the disciples except John, did give up their life for Jesus. They were, they were killed, martyred. The early church was martyred. And the great thing about martyrdom is that the seeds of the early church were the blood of the martyrs. So the more the people gave up, the more they sacrificed, the more they demonstrated their love for the early church, for Jesus. There is a link. I think what I want to just point out is that there's a link between sacrifice and love. There's a link between sacrifice and love. If you sacrifice for something or someone, there's an interesting dynamic that happens that the more you sacrifice for somebody, the deeper the love for that person becomes. If you've had children, you understand this, that Having children is, at its root, a level of sacrifice because you as parents have to give up of your time, you have to give up of your passion, you have to give up of things that you may want to do in order to create a, a life, a healthy, stable environment for your children. And Parents know this, that the more they're willing to sacrifice for their children, that the deeper the love happens for your children. And we see this in parents. I don't know if we hear these stories as much anymore because of the social network, but it used to be that if a parent wanted a better life for their children than they had, They would be willing to take one or two or three jobs in order to sacrifice so that their children might be blessed, that their children might have better opportunity than perhaps they did. This and this, it's it's not only the parents that understand this, but the children understand this too. And maybe Maybe you, maybe your parents sacrificed for you and you know how much they sacrificed for you. And because of that, because you know that they sacrificed for you, you have this deep and abiding love for your parents. And I think if a parent doesn't at some level, well, every parent does. Every parent sacrifices. There, there's always a sacrifice. And, and so the lesson in that is that the more you sacrifice of yourself, of your time, of your talent, and your treasure for your children— the more, the more that joy comes back to you and the more that deep love for your children comes back to you. I think that's what Jesus said. He said, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. In other words, the more you sacrifice and give for your children, the more joy and the more complete you are. Now, If you're a parent, you know this. If you're not a parent yet, this is one of the great joys of being a parent. And if if you're not a parent, perhaps then you understand this if you have pets or if you have other friends or other causes that you dedicate your time and passion towards. Because it's just a simple truth that the more you give, the more you, I want to say, sacrifice, uh, I keep using that word, but it's it's. We think of sacrifice as something that um, that is a negative thing, and it's not necessarily a negative thing. As a matter of fact, the more you give of yourself, you realize that it's not a negative thing. It's actually it's actually a way that God created us. That the more we give of ourselves, the more it comes back on us, and 
that is the simple truth of living in this world that Jesus taught, is that giving of ourselves is the complete joy that he wants for us. Um, So how does this translate into a church? Well, the church is an assembly of people. They gather together to sacrifice their time, their talent, and their treasure in order to pursue the kingdom of God and the work that, that Jesus has for us. And so at some level, if you are going to be involved in a church, the more you are able to invest of your resources into the congregation, it it blesses you beyond measure. It blesses you beyond measure. And those of you who have sacrificed for a congregation know this, that this is part of the reason why you continue the sacrifice. It's part of the reason why you continue to be a part of a congregation because you are able to give of yourself in order to do that. Now, the larger a congregation gets, the harder this becomes because there's so many different things a congregation does that that in order to put it all together, there has to be incredible leadership, not in leadership, but um, structure, I guess, is maybe the better word I'm talking about. There has to be incredible structure at the organizational level so that so that people can give of themselves to to do you know do the work that the congregation is pursuing and at some level at some time the congregation can be so structured that it is hard for people to get connected and engaged into a congregation and I'm, uh, and to grow as disciples there there's a church in Chicago called Willow Creek that was started founded by Bill Hybels large mega church i think they worshiped uh, in numbers about 10,000 on a sunday and they thought they were doing everything great but they did this study called the reveal study and what they found out was that the church was so long and had, or so big and it professionalized so much of everything that a lot of the things that small churches do wasn't being done in the large congregation And what are the things that a small churches do? It leverages the resources of the people. And it's not just the financial resources. It's the time resources. It's the passion resources. It's the talent resources. It's just easier to professionalize everything and not really utilize the gifts of the congregation. And and I believe that 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 is wrong. And they, they found out that that was wrong too. And so they did some restructuring trying to develop organizational structure that was better at leveraging the gifts and the passions of people in the congregation. And that's one of the things that, of course, old mainline Protestant uh, and even Catholic churches have learned throughout time is that you that a church really, really, really needs to, as much as possible, use and develop and grow and tap into the leadership structure of a congregation so that it so that people's passions can be fulfilled because the truth is the more people can invest of themselves it's like it's an it's almost an addiction it's it's so overwhelming with joy to be involved in a congregation at a very very deep and powerful level that it comes back to you and just it multiplies back into you and you crave that because that's just a part of of who you are and that's what that's you want to serve and and so uh, you want to to sacrifice for the congregation because you know that that's as Jesus said it's 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 completing your joy in a congregation and so that's really I, and I, we do when I do a, a marriage, I explain that marriage is a sacrifice, right? That you are giving up of something, you know, you're giving up your freedom to look out for the other person, to give as much as you can to the other person. And the more that you give to the other person, the deeper the love grows, the stronger the bond grows. And the more you can make your marriage about the other person, the, the deeper and wider and depth of marriage that it, you get to the end 
of, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years together. And it is no longer about you, but it's about the other person. And now the downside is, of course, that at the end of life, one of those spouses uh, goes to their heavenly home to be with Jesus. And that can be a very difficult, painful thing. But, but the joy that you have by investing in the marriage comes back to you also tenfold. And so it, it, it's all about, it's all about love. It's all about sacrifice. And, and Paul talks about this, even in Romans, just, just listen to Romans 12, 1, where Paul is talking to the Roman church and he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So Paul talks about it even being worship, that when you present yourself in the service of the kingdom, join a congregation, organization called congregation or, or what we call a church, that you are investing into the church yourself, and that becomes your living sacrifice which is holy and acceptable to God, and that is your pleasing, that is your spiritual worship. In other words, that God, God is most impressed <laughs> by worship that is basically divesting of yourself and loving the other people in your, in your family or in your community, loving other people. And, and we just know this. And so I guess... What I want to say for Christ within Veil Church is that we are called by God to find and develop and grow leadership in our congregation. And that leadership is people who are willing to come together and give of their time and their talent and their treasure in whatever way that they can possibly do that to help the organization help the church do the mission of Christ, which we've talked about before, is make loving disciples. And when we do that, we're not only following Jesus in his commands and the Great Commission, but I believe that the more we can activate and develop leadership, the healthier the congregation is. And ultimately, the more joy it comes back to the people who are in a leadership level. And so that really truly is the goal of the church. It's not just necessarily to make discipleships for, you know, make disciples for disciples' sake. It's discipleship to pursue a mission and to make the joy of the disciple complete. And that really truly is what the mission and the vision is. And this is something that we cultivate. It's something that we grow. If you've ever... I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you might have uh, your wife say, hey, we're going to go do this event <laughs> and it's good for you and you're going to enjoy it. And you're not, you're not, you've missed, you've had a long day and you don't want to do this event. And you say, I'm just, I'm just not. And you say, oh, you promised we're going to go do this. So you finally, you know, you get up, you put your shoes on, you, you go out of the house, you go to the event and you find out that it was something that you just was phenomenally great. And so you say, man, I really, really, really enjoyed that. That was fantastic. You may not tell your wife about that, but you, uh, you really, really enjoyed it. So, the, the, you know, the, I call it the kicking and screaming before you go out the door. And, and the same is true for, for leadership. At some level, at some level, at every level of the congregation, you as a leader or you as a person who's going to be involved in a church Somebody came up and asked you, hey, can you do something? And there's this initial reaction which says, oh, no, I, I've, I've, got all, I've got enough on my plate. I really, really don't want to do this. But if you can break down that, that something that needs to be done to, to a small manageable piece, maybe it's just a one-time thing for two hours or maybe a one-time thing for 15 minutes or whatever, and if you can convince or cajole or encourage or walk along somebody to say, okay, I'll find, I will do this one thing because you've asked me or because maybe my spouse has asked me or because you've made a plea or whatever, that you finally get that person to do that one thing, then once they finish it, they will, I guarantee you, if it's part of the kingdom of God and they do it, they will have made a sacrifice 
and that joy will come back upon them. And a good leader or a pastoral person or something might come alongside them and say, thank you so much for doing what you did. You can't believe how important that was. And it is, it is blessing the congregation. It's blessing the, the kingdom. This is a great thing. Thank you so, so much. And so when the next time you come and ask, they might be a little bit more desirous of doing that. And then pretty soon, you might grant them, a, you know, you might ask them to do a bigger and bigger thing. And then at some point, you might ask them, hey, would you be able to take leadership role in this particular area? And because they've worked and they've cultivated and they've understood a little bit the joy, not only of doing the work, but also the joy of being around another group of people who are passionate towards that, then, then they grow. And then pretty much the church continues to grow and grow and grow. And that's that truly is the joy of being a congregation. And I think sometimes congregations can be so institutionalized at what they've always done that they never allow this growth of leadership. Now, we in Vail are a little bit, um, how do I want to say this? We are in a unique situation because we do have such a combination of long-time established people in the Vale community, but we also have a highly transient portion in the Vale community. And we live by Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and over the years we've gotten a tremendous number of Air Force people who have been involved. They come in, they, they get involved for a couple years, and they leave. And that presents its own set of challenges because, as was pointed out yesterday, some of the greatest leaders that we produce actually do come from the military. They, they can come from these leaders in the, in the Davis Monthan Air, Air Force Base. And so trying to get them connected in a leadership role and activated in a leadership role, that obviously... Like, how do you identify that, yes, this is a person that has a track record of leadership, they love Jesus, they love serving in churches, and and how do you get them involved and activated in a particular ministry in a very, very high level quickly because they know all this stuff? Well, that's a challenge for a church that is like ours, that has long-term established leaders, but also people that are coming and going uh, in a very, very transient fashion because of just the nature of a bedroom community of a, of a large metropolitan area. So that's another challenge that we have. But we have to fight the forces of stagnation to be able to, to elevate and bring people in because when we do, it becomes a symphony. When we do, it becomes a symphony. And I think uh, what I'd like to do is maybe, um, there's been a viral TikTok video that has been going around. It's a guy named... Nathan Evans, I think is his name. Yeah, I think that's it. He's a Scottish singer. He's got a YouTube channel. Somebody said, well, you're Scottish. Why don't you sing some Scottish sea chanties, sea shanties? And so he started singing his, some sea shanties. Well, he did one called the Weller Man. The Weller Man is the guy that comes out onto a whaling boat and gives um, you know, supplies on the whaling boat because these whaling boats would go out for long periods of time, you know, looking for whales and all that sort of thing. And they would fill up, they would fill up the the whale blubber at the bottom, you know, boil the whale blubber in. They would come in and they'd be out to sea for 18 months. Well, sometimes you'd have the wellerman come and actually give supplies. And so this is the story about the wellerman. Well, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's kind of a metaphor for our congregation in that, you know, somebody has an idea a leader has an idea and they say, hey, this is my idea for something. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have a lady in our congregation who had an idea for um, doing an online conference. And uh, so she kind of, she started beating the drum and then people gathered around her. We have another lady in our congregation that said, want to do a youth conference. And so she started beating the drum and people came around her. And, and other people that say, hey, let's do this, and they beat the drum and people come around them. I mean, it's just, it's just a great metaphor for how a church can grow and a, a vision can grow organically around wonderful leaders. And I, I want to just play this, um, this song for you because it's, it's, uh, what happened is that he, he sang this song and he put it out on TikTok. It's called the TikTok Wellerman Song. And other people said, hey, this is really cool. I want to add 
uh, my part to it. And so they sang and they and they bring their joy into this song. And then they put it out on the internet and other people are like, well, hey, I want to add a part to it. And then pretty soon you have this whole symphony of music because of people adding their little gifts into this, this vision of, of this song. And this is so much, uh, if, if you are a leader of congregation, you've ever wanted to be a leader of congregation, just, just imagine that you're beating this drum and you're singing and then you're bringing people alongside of you. This is called the Wellerman song. And uh, just just listen to this, if you wouldn't mind, for a little bit, because this is um, this is really exciting. This was a ship that put to sea. The name of the Completely ship was a belly of Scottish. tea. The winds blew up her bow, up down below my belly boys blow. Soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. That's a leader. She had not been two weeks from shore Beats when down on her a right whale bore. The captain called all hands and swore he'd take that whale in tow. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done we'll take our leave and go. Soon may the weather man come to bring us Sometimes sugar you're and tea the and rum. One day when the tonguing is done we'll people. take our leave and go. She had not been two weeks from shore when down on her a right whale bore. The captain called all hands and swore he'd take, take that whale in tow. Soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done we'll take our leave and go. Soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done we'll take our leave and go. She had not been two weeks from shore when down on her a right a vision. whale bore. The captain people just get excited about it. They want to be a part of it. That that this draws people to it. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and That's beautiful rum. music. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. I think we'll leave it at that. Um, it, it goes on and they add violins and they add some other strings. And if you haven't seen it, you should go onto YouTube and watch for the Wellerman. There's probably 50 of them out there. And of course, I like this one because uh, it's got a men, right at the beginning, it's just all men singing. And if you've ever seen a men choir, uh, you know, a glee club. This is just, there's just something exciting about it. And um, this is, if uh, all, all a leader is, is basically saying, hey, let's, we've got this idea, let's try it. And if it's a great idea and it impacts the kingdom of God and it brings people around, I, I, I just see that people want to flock to it. They want to be a part of it. They want to be part of this great symphony of people making a change, making a difference, being a life-changing connection for people in our kingdom. And that truly is, that's what, that to create this, these types of symphonies in our church is really, really where I think why God's called us to be a church in the Vail community. So I think I'll leave you with that. And uh, thank you for joining me today. Let's, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, for the blessings of this day, we thank you. Continue to guide us, direct our church during this Lenten season. Season, We continue to pray for your wisdom and your guidance to raise up people to beat your drum and to join, to excite people to join in. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for joining me. And uh, as I mentioned, we will, coming out of Easter, we will start meeting as uh, in groups to try to figure out all the different things that to all the different uh, processes that God wants us to do and, and how we're going to assemble those and get people excited about that and, and to beat the drum about that. And so that stay tuned for that. Um, we'll probably end it there. Thank you for joining me today. God's richest blessings. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.